Thank you, Michael, for that very kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening, an honor to address members of an association that leads the way in promoting international understanding. So I thank you for this opportunity. I'm an economist by training and profession. Years ago, in addition to teaching survey courses on, in microeconomics and, and industrial organization, I also taught courses on such subjects as the political economy of oil and the competitive competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing industry. Uh, these topics reflected a longstanding interest in the politics and economics of world affairs. And now, of course, I see these issues from the dual perspective of an inter international economist and a university president. I suspect, this, despite your interest in foreign affairs, that you are not often inclined to put universities and foreign policy in the same sentence. So let me offer a provocative hypothesis, that the American Research University is a highly effective instrument of US foreign policy. And that will be my thesis for the evening. It would be an even more effective instrument if our political leaders understood fully what a unique and powerful asset our country has in its great universities. I'm going to state the case in six parts. First, America's power, both hard and soft, derives from the strength of its economy, the current credit crunch notwithstanding. The strength of our economy depends in large part on our leadership in science which in turn depends upon the strength of our research universities. Second, the strength of our economy also derives from our capacity to innovate, which in turn depends upon the kind of education that American universities and top liberal arts colleges provide. Third, US research universities are magnets for the most outstanding students from around the world. Those students either stay here or they go home. And America wins either way. If foreign graduates stay, they strengthen the nation, uh, they strengthen the productive capacity of the US economy. If they go home, they increase the capacity of their home economies, but they also serve as ambassadors for openness, freedom, uh, for openness, freedom of expression, and democracy. Fourth, our great universities are increasingly ensuring that American students gain exposure to the culture and values of another nation as part of their educational experience. This offers the hope that our future leaders and engaged citizens will have greater global awareness in the future than they have in the past. Fifth, our universities have broadened the conception of what constitutes a student. Today, we provide leadership education to specialized audiences around the world to help them address challenges to global, and politi global political and economic stability, to public health, and to the environment. And finally, with respect to at least one important item on the global agenda, foreshadowed by Professor uh, Reisman's introduction, how to respond to the threat of global warming, our universities have become laboratories to demonstrate that solutions are technically possible and economically feasible. Let me discuss each of these six points in turn. <clears throat> First, leadership in science. For decades, America's competitive advantage in global markets has derived from its capacity to innovate, to introduce and develop new products, processes, and services. That capacity depends in large part on America's leadership in science, which is the principle, um, uh, which in turn is, is based principally in our research universities. The emergence of universities as America's primary machine for scientific advance did not come about by accident. It was the product of a wise and far-sighted national science policy set forth in an important 1946 report that established the framework for an unprecedented and heavily subsidized system in support of scientific research that has propelled the American economy. The system 
rests upon three principles that remain largely intact today. First, the federal government shoulders the principal, res the principal responsibility for financing basic science. Second, universities rather than government laboratories or non-teaching research institutes or private industry are the primary institutions in which basic research funded by the government is undertaken. This ensures that scientists, scientists in training, even those who choose industrial rather than academic careers, are exposed to the most advanced methods and results of research. And third, although the federal budgetary process determines the total funding that's available for each of the various fields of science, most funds are allocated not according to commercial or political considerations, but through an intensely competitive process of review, peer review, conducted by independent scientific experts who judge the proposals on their scientific merit alone. This system of organizing science has been an extraordinary success, both scientifically and economically. Oddly enough, for political and cultural reasons, no other nation has successfully imitated the U.S. system of supporting basic science, um, which of course is the source from which all commercially oriented applied research and development ultimately flows. In Europe, for example, too much research is concentrated in national institutes uh, rather than universities, divorcing cutting-edge research from training the next generation